set up of a position versus time graph. Across the horizontal axis, we have our independent variable, which in this case we'll use time in seconds. On the vertical axis, we have the dependent variable, and in this case we'll call this position, and we're gonna use the units of meter. And we'll continue to use these units throughout all of this video. Let's start by putting some data or some graphing on this position versus time graph. Now we can do this with a simple set of data. In this case, we've got some positions and we've got some times associated with those positions. And we're gonna transpose those or translate those onto our graph. Okay, so now we have this example of a position versus time graph and we can see that there are some variations in what's happening on this graph. We can see on this position versus time graph that the entire motion takes 11 seconds and we have the positions on the left hand side. One of the first things we need to realize when we look at a position versus time graph is that it is motion in one dimension. What that means is we're going in one direction throughout all of this motion. One of the common misconceptions that happen when we first look at a position versus time graph is we might think that, for example, in this section A, that we're walking up a hill, and then in section B, that we're across the top of the hill, section C, we're coming down the hill, and section D, we're walking up another hill. Well, this is not the case. This is not what is happening in this position versus time graph. We are in one dimension, meaning we don't have any hills to walk up and down. It's just one direction forward and backwards. Let's look at a motion that would fit this position versus time graph to make sure we're understanding as much as we can from it. Let's say, for example, that we have a bicycle that starts at three meters away from a point that we've determined to be zero. That bicycle would then move in three seconds from three meters away to nine meters away. It would be stationary for two seconds. Then it would turn around and go the opposite direction, nine meters, back to what we've identified as our starting point or our origin. And then it turns around again, and in four seconds, it moves four meters away. We can see from the combination of that motion and the position versus time graph, what we mean by this being motion in one dimension. That object or that bicycle is moving only in one dimension, back and forth, but not up a hill or anything of that sort. We can see when we first look at this position versus time graph that the object started three meters away from what we call the origin. Now we can look at any time on this graph and see where that object was. For example, if we look at four seconds, we can see that the object was nine meters away from this origin. Same is true if we look at 10 seconds, we can see that the object was three meters away from the origin. So this is very helpful for us to be able to identify where an object was and at what times it was there. Now one of the most important tools that we have on a position versus time graph is the slope of the line. Now if we look at section A, we can remember that a slope is the rise over the run, or the change in the y over the change in x, or if we're looking specifically at a position versus time graph, it's the change in the position over the change in time, or the change in its meters divided by the change in its seconds. Or if we look specifically at the units of this slope, it would be meters over seconds. If we remember a velocity, if we remember, if, if we remember the units of velocity are also velocity. that the slope of velocity. If we remember the units of velocity are also velocity of that object is. And if we have a constant slope, for example, what we have in section A, we have a constant velocity. Now let's look specifically at the slope on the different pieces of the motion of this object, and that will help us to figure out what the velocity is during each part of the motion. This will give us some more tools so that we can compare these velocities together and begin to understand this motion much better. Let's start with section A. As we talked about before, from this we see that the object starts at three meters away from the origin and moves to nine meters away, and that this takes three seconds. We wanna look at the slope of this line, which is the rise over the run, or in this case, it's the change in the y divided by the change in time. We can also write this as the position final minus the position initial divided by the change in time. In this case, our position final is nine meters minus our position initial, which is three meters, divided by the change in our time, which is three seconds. This gives us six meters divided by three seconds, which if we do that math is two meters per second. Now we wanna be careful to note that this is a positive slope, meaning it's slanted upward, and that tells us that the direction or the motion of the object is away from our origin or our starting point. We'll look at this more closely when we look at the slope of section C, since it's opposite or a negative slope. 
So we've determined that the slope of section A is two meters per second. Now this is also the velocity of the object at this time. It was moving at two meters per second. That means that every second, the object had moved another two minutes. So at zero seconds, the object was at three meters. After one second, it would be at five meters away. And after two seconds, it would be at seven meters away. And after three seconds, it would be at nine meters away. Now we can see that that matches up with what we see on our position versus time graph. Let's take a look at section B. Here we have a change in position that's equal to zero. It doesn't change its position at all over those two seconds. So if we look at our equation, we've got the rise over the run. Well, the rise in this situation is zero. That gives us a slope of zero. This means that the object didn't change its position at all during this time. It was standing still or in place. Now let's take a look at section C. This slope, as we can tell, looks a little bit different from the slope in section A. Let's start by calculating the slope or the velocity of the object in section C. Now we want to look again for the rise over the run, or as we talked about before, the position final minus the position initial divided by the change in our time. Now our final position is zero meters. Our initial position is nine meters. And our change in our time is two seconds. Now as we calculate this out, we determine that it's negative nine meters divided by two seconds. We do this math and it gives us a slope or a, a velocity of negative 4.5 meters per second. The key thing to look at is the negative on the negative 4.5 meters per second. This negative sign denotes the direction of the object. Now on section A, we talked about how it had a positive slope and it was moving away from our origin or our starting point. In this case, we have a negative slope, which means the object is moving towards our origin. So every second with a slope of negative 4.5 meters per second, that object is getting 4.5 meters closer to its starting point. In more simple terms, this tells us that the object is moving the opposite direction in section C than it was in section A. Let's finish up by determining the slope of our final section, section D. Now again, we're going to use the same steps. We're going to look for the final position, subtracted by the initial position, divided by the change in time. Our final position is 4 meters, minus our initial position, which is 0 meters, and we divide all of that by the 4 seconds that it took for this motion to happen. And we can figure out that 4 meters divided by 4 seconds is equal to 1 meter per second. We'll also note that this is a positive slope, meaning the object is moving away from the origin, the same direction that it was moving in section A. Now let's look and compare the slopes of section A and section D. The slope in section A was 2 meters per second, and the slope in section D is 1 meter per second. We'll also note on the graph that the look of the slope in section D is less steep than the look of the slope in section A. So the greater velocity an object has, the greater slope it will have on a position versus time graph. Let's take this chance to look again at the difference between displacement and distance traveled. Now a reminder that displacement is how far out of place an object is, and distance is how much ground has the object covered. Now if we look at this example in our position versus time graph, we can see that the object's displacement it started at 3 meters away, from the origin and it ended at four meters away is only one meter. It's been displaced over this whole motion only one meter even though it traveled a lot of distance. Let's look at the distance traveled of this object. We can see in section A it went from three meters to nine meters away which is six meters traveled and in section B it didn't move at all so that's zero meters traveled. In section C it went from nine meters away to zero meters away so that's nine meters traveled and in section D, it went from zero meters away to four meters away. Now, if we add all of these distances up, we determine that the distance traveled of this object is 19 meters. So there is a good example of the differences between displacement, or how far out of place an object is, and distance traveled, or how much ground the object has covered. Let's now take a look at how this position versus time graph relates to a velocity versus time graph. We've already gone through the steps to determine the slope of the line or the velocity of the object in each section of its motion. And we can use this information to build a velocity time graph that describes what's happening in this motion. Now when we build a velocity versus time graph, it's important to note the differences in how we set this up from a position versus time graph. 
You'll notice on the vertical axis that instead of position, we have velocity, which has units of meters per second. And across the horizontal axis, we still have time in seconds. Let's start by graphing section A on our velocity versus time graph. We determined that the velocity in section A, or the slope of the line, was two meters per second. If we look at our velocity time graph, we can see that it should, from zero seconds to three seconds, be traveling at a constant velocity, because of the constant slope on the position versus time graph, of two meters per second. And we can go ahead and add that on our velocity versus time graph. The next section of motion, section B, the velocity is equal to zero, and that lasts for two seconds. And we can identify that on our velocity versus time graph by putting a velocity of zero meters per second from three seconds to five seconds. The next section, section C that we looked at, we determined that the velocity was negative 4.5 meters per second. So we have a negative 4.5 meters per second slope and we can put that where negative 4.5 would be on our velocity time graph. And we can see that that lasts for two seconds. Now remember that the negative sign here on negative 4.5 meters per second just tells us the direction of the object. So instead of moving away from what we call our origin or our starting point, it's moving back towards that point. Then to finish up the motion, we have a positive slope again of one meter per second in the positive direction. Now from this, we can see how position versus time graphs and velocity versus time graphs connect and how we can transpose from one to the other.